Section 8 of Dog Heroes of Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dog Heroes of Many Lands by Sarah Noble Lives. Chapter 8 Bracky, a Kaffir Dog. The lion was dead, no doubt as to that. He lay motionless, his ragged black mane stained with blood, and the small knife that had cut his strand of life still sticking in his throat. His yellow tawny eyes had not yet lost their luminous glitter, and his jaws were set just as when he had last torn the flesh of the man who lay beside him. The man was a kaffir, big, black, and muscular, bred to the wild, or he never could have killed the lion in a single combat, old though it was, so old that one of his fangs was missing. The man, too, appeared at first to be dead. Bracky thought he was. He crept up, whining uneasily, and began licking his master's wounds. After a while, Wanya, the man, groaned and opened his eyes. The soothing touch of the little tongue on his broken body brought him partly to consciousness. The hot South African sun poured relentlessly down into the kloof where he lay. Up above him he could see the wheeling vultures that had already scented the dead lion. It would not do to lie too near. With an agonizing effort he dragged himself on his elbows up to the rise and into the shadow of a clump of prickly pear bushes. Once in the shade he lapsed again into a dead stupor. Bracky had seen his master lie asleep many a time, but never like this. This was different. And Bracky loved him. He must do something. The little dog scampered away among the karoo bushes and was gone half an hour. When he returned, Wanya was sitting up, looking in a dazed way at his wounds. There were many, and one leg was terribly lacerated. Bracky held in his mouth a dead bird, not yet cold. This he laid at his master's feet. He looked up at Wanya, wriggling and wagging his tail, happy to have done a service. "'Good dog,' said Wanya, in the Kaffir tongue. "'I will not starve with you to help find food for me. I must fix this leg, though. The lion made a bad crunching.' With great trouble, and with his teeth set to the pain of it, he managed to close the gaping wound, fastening it with a wisp of grass. Then he fainted again. Bracky waited near, whining for recognition of his gift. When Wanya returned to consciousness, Bracky had laid the bird in his hand. A good thought, said Wanya. To eat will give strength. My knife, ah, the lion has it. I must do without. He skinned the bird with his fingers and ate the raw flesh. There was still water in the flask he carried at his side, and he took a scanty mouthful, knowing that with the rising fever of his wounds there would be infinite need of economizing the precious drops. With such leaves and grasses as he could reach from where he lay, he roughly tended his other wounds. It was a poor substitute for surgical dressing, but it must do. Someone might come that way and save him. He was off the beaten track, but there were always chances, and men learn in the South African bush to take chances and look for them. Exhausted, he lay back again and slept. When he awoke, Bracky was again licking the wounds as if they were his own. The sun had dipped behind the rim of the wide Karoo country. The twilight softened rough rock and clay and thorny cacti alike into velvet. The wind stole softly over the desert distances and touched Wanya's black forehead with its cool fingers. He slept again, and Bracky lay beside him under the stars. Morning. When Wanya awoke, he had first to break through a numbing stiffness. The hot needles of pain stirred him again, and he opened his eyes to look straight into the eyes of Bracky, who stood above him. In Bracky's mouth was a little flying squirrel, fresh killed. Bracky was not a beautiful dog. He was just one of those curs of mean descent that one sees in the Kaffir kraals. But Bracky was distinguished above others of his race by the qualities of his master. 
Wanya was good to him and did not kick and beat him, and the little dog's devotion was fearless and doubly loyal. He laid the animal down and barked, Breakfast time, to Wanya, and Wanya blessed the gods of his religion and ate. There was not much flesh, only a few mouthfuls, and he threw the cleanly picked bones to Bracky. Bracky did not touch them. Instead, he yapped an explanation to the effect that he understood it was a poor meal for a man and was off again. In an hour, he returned with a spring haas, or jumping hare. This was a great find, and Wanya satisfied his hunger, and with one draft of water felt that he might pull through the day. Bracky, too, seeing that there was plenty and to spare, crunched hungrily the tender bones. The shade where Wanya lay was good, for the clump of prickly pear was thick and tall. Moreover, from the tips of its fat leaves hung red fruit. Not the best fruit in the world, the prickly pear, but it is juicy, and that means much in a desert country. The sun rose high in the blue, a swimming haze of heat quivered over a dust-yellow plain, and Wanya's wounds throbbed from mere pain into torture. But for Bracky he could not have stood it. The dog seemed to have decided that he was the trained nurse on the case without a doctor, and his training was to lick the wounds and to keep them clean and free from festering germs. As he would have done for himself, so he did unto Wanya, and the man was saved from blood poisoning and was grateful. When his master dropped asleep, Bracky was off foraging. It was not easy to find food enough to meet the demands of Wanya's hunger, but he did his best. A sound or a scent, and Bracky went stalking in that direction. How he would steal up to a bird or a squirrel, he might tell you. I cannot. But Quartermaster Bracky never let a day go by without bagging and bringing into camp one or more victims. Now and again, if Wanya offered him the bones which he could not eat, Bracky would crunch them, but usually he sat by, watching his master's meal with dumb devotion. Once, an army of ants went by. Wanya could see them on the copy just below him hurrying along, all eager to reach some treasure their scouts had discovered. He waited in horror. If they came his way, it meant, in his helpless condition, death. Death too awful to think of. He held his breath. One or two stragglers turned toward him, but immediately faced about, returning to the original scent. Past him they scurried, a long, sinister train. And Wanya breathed again. It was the lion lying down there in the kloof that had attracted them. The living man was spared. The days went by. The water was all gone from the canteen, and now the prickly pears were called into use. With a dead stalk, Wanya could dislodge one from the bush above him. Then, peeling away the uncomfortable prickly skin, he would suck the juices from the pulp. Down in the kloof, Bracky had found a tiny pool in a rock cup, left by the rains, and the warm brackish liquid was enough to slake his thirst. Thus he kept himself alive for his master's service. Always, from day to day, Wanya's suffering increased. Seven times the sun-dragon leaped from the east, forked with fury, and shot its fiery rays down at him, each one tipped with the poison of pain. Then the kindly shade of the prickly pears would crawl to him and save him from going mad. The eighth, and then the ninth morning came. Wanya lay in a delirium. Now he would start up, raving, because a milk bush had pointed its fingers at him. He was sure now that it was turning into a Zulu warrior threatening him with his asagi. And he lay there helpless, unable to rise and fight it out. Now a vulture swooped down from the wheeling circle above the lion and sat eyeing him, until he made a violent effort and frightened it away. Now the agony of his wounds was as hot irons, searing him. 
Now he was back in the kraal where he had been born, watching the warriors in their rejoicing over some victory, and wondering when he too would be a man and a warrior, with spear and shield. Now a lion with black mane stood over him, ready to devour him. He cried aloud, and struck out to be first with his own claws, and the thing was bowled over. It was Bracky. The dog picked himself up and looked at his master, wondering and bewildered. That was not like Wanya. Other masters struck their Brackies, but not his, not his Wanya. He would get him another bird. No doubt he was hungry. Bracky started off. Game was not too plenty. If only now he were strong enough to bring down one of those harder beasts grazing on the belt. That would make a feast that would cure Wanya and save Bracky himself from starvation. His own emaciated little body cried out for nourishment. But always first, when he had the strength, he must look out for his master. It was harder now. Bracky was weak and could not leap far for his prey after he had stalked it. At last, after several vain efforts, a squirrel jumped the wrong way, and Bracky had him. The long day was nearly spent now. With the fresh food and the cool of the night, Wanya would be better. The dog dropped his game in his master's outstretched hand, and waited expectantly. Wanya lay still, stiller than ever. Bracky barked. The Kaffir did not wake him. A little tongue flicked over the black face. Wanya was not dead, but he no longer knew or heeded his dumb servant. He lay hovering between life and death, now and then muttering something that Bracky could only half hear and wholly failed to understand. Bracky did not sleep. All night he watched now, tending his master's wounds, now lying by his side with his nose on Wanya's arm, looking into his face with a growing fear. The coolness brought no change to the sick man. Under the dark dome he lay, with his face upturned and his eyes sightless. The stars marched on their unaltered courses across the sky. Dawn came, with the promise, or the threat, of another unbearable day, perhaps the last for Wanya. The squirrel lay in Wanya's hand untouched. His feet were in the dark valley, and he did not even know the sun had risen. High noon again, hot and blistering. Again the heat waves danced and shimmered over the Karoo country. The milk bushes pointed their fingers in vain. Wanya lay as one dead. Bracky awoke from a doze of exhaustion and turned his nose in the direction of the wind. Across the arid plain came the scent of something that made the dog leap to his feet. Wavering with weakness, he started in the direction whence it came. That was the smell of meat cooking, and there would be men and help, help for Wanya. Over the copy he dragged himself. Now the air stirred more freshly, and the scent grew stronger. Through the prickly pear and karoo bushes he pushed his way. Up near the top of the kopje, where there was wind enough blowing to cool them after the morning's exertion, a party of hunters had dismounted from their sweating horses. They built a fire and were preparing their noonday meal. They were a jolly trio, and, flushed with the success of the morning, they made merry and laughed to scorn the scorching heat of the South African sun. Three dead blessbok lay in the shade of the bushes, and the kaffir beater of the party of Englishmen skinned and prepared the flesh of another animal for roasting over the coals. Now the savory odors floated away on the wind, mingled with the aroma of boiling coffee. The hunters threw themselves down in the best shade they could find and watched the operations of the kaffir servant. They had not long to wait until the meal was ready, and they lost no time in gathering around the appetizing luncheon. "'Well, I'm glad, for one, that I came to Kimberley to hunt,' said Jack Aronson. "'Other people may go skirmishing around here after diamonds, but it'd be a good big precious stone that I would take in exchange for that gallop over the veldt in the early morning before we sighted the herd.' 
somehow it seemed a shame to kill em they were having as much fun as we were dick colby the smallest and most thoughtful looking of the three helped himself to another piece of meat wade ashton laughed lazily you seem to be enjoying the result of the hunt as much as anybody and i'll wager you were as excited as any of us when you brought down your buck i'll own up to a certain amount of inconsistency the sport of chasing the jolly little beast is fine but i'll never get over the feeling of having committed a crime when i see a beautiful animal lift his head and look at me snort and then crumple down into a lump of meat you'll never make a hunter dick said jack you haven't the true sporting instinct you're a cracking good shot though pity you're so tender-hearted well said dick thoughtfully you see my first experiment at hunting was unfortunate when i was a small shaver i used to practice with my first little rifle shooting at a sardine tin down by the stables at home when i got so i could hit the tin in the white of its eye i was fired with an ambition to go farther and do real deeds i wandered down through the kitchen garden looking for game a little bird was sitting on the cherry tree singing its heart out just bubbling over the thing you call the sporting instinct gripped me i aimed and fired never dreaming that i could hit anything so small he wasn't bigger than my thumb without any rhyme or reason in the world I killed a song. Every time I ever hit anything since, I hear that little bird. Rotten, isn't it? You're a poet, Dick, said Wade. Mere men like Jack and me can't get these fine side lights on things. What's that? Do you fellows see a ghost of a dog over there, or am I seeing a mirage? A little ragged animal, with his bones barely hidden by his baggy skin, peered out from behind a karoo bush just above them and whined piteously. Jack, the elder and host of the party, turned his head. That? That's a bracky, one of those mangy curs that hive with the kaffirs. The crowds swarm with them sometimes. Don't encourage him, he'll never leave us. I don't mind a good dog in camp, but we don't want that thing following us. Throw something at him, Wade. A lump of clay went hurtling in the direction of this apology for a dog. He dodged the missile and came near. Again and yet again Wade aimed at him, each time with the same result. At last he came within a few feet of them and set up a heartbroken wail. I believe the brute's starving, said Dick. Here, I'll try him with a piece of meat. Dick threw a big piece at him and the dog leaped halfway to meet it, snapping his jaws with a click. It was so large and he so weak that it knocked him over. Together the dog and meat went rolling down the copy until they brought up under a milk bush. Struggling to its feet, the bracky seized the meat and bounded weakly away out of sight among the bushes. Cowardly curs, those afraid to eat in sight of us. He'll sneak off and gorge himself. Here's hoping he won't come back and attach himself to us permanently. There's one thing sure, said Wade. He won't need anything more to eat for a day or two. Ten minutes later, Dick looked over the edge of his third cup of coffee. As I live, there he is again. Wade laughed. Did he eat all that meat in that space of time? He certainly was low in his commissary department. Give him another, a good big chunk dick threw him a piece larger than the first the bracky seized it and made off with it as before they say a kaffir can eat his own weight in food if the cur eats that i can testify that the dog is the equal to his master look said dick there he is again and he looks as thin as ever i can't see where he puts it well our meal's finished and there's more meat left here you copy or bracky or spring beast what's the kaffir for catch a large portion of meat fell at the dog's feet this time he did not touch it he simply sniffed it hungrily and stood looking first at it and then at the men with big piteous eyes something's wrong with him said dick he's trying to tell us see him quiver all over and i'll wager a shillin he's hungry yet 
There was a ravenous longing in every motion when he smelled that meat. Just watch him. The dog gave a quick short yelp, ran behind the bushes, then came back looking up expectantly and wistfully. He's playing some kind of game, I should judge, said Wade. No, he isn't. I believe he's trying to make us follow him. Dick rose and took a few steps toward the animal. The bracky gave a joyous bark and bounded up the rise, looking back now and then to see if he was followed. "'Come on, fellas, let's plug the heart out of this mystery,' said Wade, and he and Jack followed leisurely. Up the copy to the very summit they followed. Then the dog took a sharp turn to the right, plunged down the other side into a kloof, and disappeared behind a clump of prickly pear bushes. "'Someone's been here,' said Dick. Look at the prickly pear skins thrown about. Jove, someone's here now. The dog was licking the face of a kaffir, who lay on the ground motionless. Almost as emaciated as the dog, he seemed, here and there on his body were evidences of half-healed wounds. One leg was rudely bound with leaves and grass, now dried and crackling with the heat. All about him lay the cleanly picked bones of small animals and birds, and by his limp claw-like hand lay a dead squirrel and two pieces of meat, untouched. Bracky looked up into the faces of his relief party to see if they understood. He whined, but his master made no sign. Jack Aronson stooped over the man and brushed away the flies. Then he knelt and listened to see if the heart had stopped beating. Not dead, but pretty well out of the running. Think that we can save him? Perhaps. We can make a try. What do you think happened? Don't know. Fight of some kind. Those wounds are torn, not cut. Some animal, probably. Wade examined the ground. Here's a trail of some kind. Yes, it looks as if he had crawled some distance to get there. Let's explore a bit. Jack led the way. The trail was plain. The man had evidently dragged himself that way. The dried blood still showed here and there. Not far to find, the lion lay there ten days killed, the flesh all stripped from the bones by the vultures and ants. The small knife, too, was there still. All around were evidences of a fearful struggle. And the Kaffir killed him with that half-whispered Dick. I'd hate to tackle the brute with a two-edged sword, let alone a little dinky knife like that. Let's go back and see what we can do for that fellow up there. He must be worth something, or his dog wouldn't care for him so much. Gently they examined the man. He's merely suffering from his wounds and loss of blood, said Jack. He hasn't starved, thanks to that dog of his. And I have a notion that a drink of cool water would go a long way toward making him see daylight. Jove, that lion nearly finished him. I don't see how the man ever pulled out alive. Here, you fellows, lend a hand and we'll get him into camp. Come on, copy, or whatever you are, said Dick. You're worth caring for, too. I'd be proud to own you myself. In the camp, Wanya was given water. Drop by drop it was forced between his parched lips. At last he opened his eyes. Bracky, he said, and closed them again. And Bracky was there. Oh, be sure of that. Bracky of the loyal heart. He stood and watched the ministrations. When his master had really come back to life, had eaten and drunk all that it was safe to give him, he too ate and drank like the starved thing he was. Wanya's wounds were bathed and dressed, and on one of the hunter's horses he was taken to Kimberley, and placed in the hospital. His iron constitution served him well. In three weeks he was well and strong again. He proved to be no common kaffir, but was intelligent above his race, and proud indeed he was when he was elected unanimously as beater for the party. And Bracky? There was no question of his position. He was already aide-de-camp to Wanya, and in a short time even Jack's scorn for Kaffir curs had ceased to exist. As an attaché of the hunting outfit, he proved himself invaluable. He had a nose for game and four willing feet, and eagerness to be of service and affection for everybody. But next to Wanya in Bracky's heart, Dick was enshrined. 
for Dick had been first to understand, and there was no need of speech between them. End of Section 8「Section 9 of Dog Heroes of Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sherry Lothridge. Dog Heroes of Many Lands by Sarah Noble Ives. Chapter 9. Ask Him, an Indian Dog. We reached the old red lion house about five in the afternoon of a wonderful August day. A little late in the season it was for the best fishing, but it was something to know that the black flies and mosquitoes would be thinned out, and that what fishing we did would lack this annoyance of the great north woods. It was good to leave the dusty CPR at the little lumbering village. It was solid comfort to shed the trappings of civilization and settle into serviceable woods togs. It was delicious to skim over Spider Lake in a steam yacht that ran by tea kettle power and breathe the spicy odors of the pines and psalms on shore, mingled with the reek of old skipper, Jack's oil can, and the blessed aroma of wood smoke. It was an experience never to be forgotten, that ten-mile ride in the rickety buckboard over hills of stumps and down dales of mud puddles. And here at last I climbed down and stretched the kinks out of my arms and legs, the line house stood gaunt and bare in the middle of a clearing, around which rose fir-clad slopes, with vistas between, blue with what wonderful depth of color one sees on a very clear day. Its name was due to the fact that it was built on the state line, half in Maine and half in the province of Quebec. Its fame came down from old smuggling days, when its advantageous position made it a most convenient place to obey customs. You had only to shift your contraband articles across the line, and there you were. Now it had become a wayside inn for trappers, hunters, sportsmen, and lumberjacks. I elected to stay here for the evening meal, after which we would tramp over to Arnold Pond a mile farther on. There we would find boats to take us across to the camp, which was to be our base of supplies for a month. On the stoop sat a lad about eleven years of age, one arm around a rickety pillar, the other slung across the shoulder of a sober-minded tan-colored dog. The pair had that nameless something about them that irresistibly attracts. "'Hello, Sonny, is that your dog?' "'Dad's. It's the same thing.' "'What's his name? Ask him.' "'Why, he couldn't answer if I did.' "'Ha, ha!' laughed the boy. "'You're fooled. Everybody is, first time.' It's a trick name. That's really it. Just ask him. Ha <laughs> ha, I chorused amiably. I certainly was fooled. How did he come by such a name as that? Why, you see, he's an Injun dog. An old trapper gave him to Dad. His squaw was sick or something, and Dad gave her a dose that cured her. The Injun was mighty grateful, and about a week after, Dad meant the whole outfit moving, and the squaw was toting the papoose and the wigwam poles like she had never been sick. The engine he up dog to Dad, for a thing offering or something. The boy hugged the dog a little closer. And when Dad said, What's his name? the engine answered, Ask him. Him heap smart beaver dog. So Dad just called him that. He's a trick dog, too. This promised to be interesting. I sat down on the other side of the dog, who looked at me in a dignified way, and then let his gaze rove off to the hill line. On the edge of the wood the lonesome birds were thrilling the air with their long, soft notes. No doubt that Askham heard them, and no doubt that he heard other and finer sounds that the stunted instincts of the human race may not fathom. What tricks can he do? Shake hands. Ask him. The dog gravely lifted his paw for me to shake, after which a lump of sugar was purloined from the supper table, and he was induced to hold it on his nose and catch it. Then at the words of command he went solemnly through all his round of tricks. He fetched and carried, stood on his head, sneezed, walked on his hind legs, and ended by saying his prayers, with his head bowed over the boy's shoulder. When the performance was over he took his seat again by the boy. The applause of the onlookers did not move him. It was enough that he had performed the duty his little master had imposed upon him. Life was evidently a weighty matter with him. Serious and silent he sat there, like the Indians among whom he was bred. 
He's more in that, and better in that. Indeed, what a remarkable animal. What else can he do? He's a beaver dog, and a real one. That engine trained him when he was a puppy, so he can smell him out anywhere. The engines trap the beavers for their skins, and ask him used to go along and find them. I don't know how that engine ever parted with him. He must have been mighty grateful to Dad. There's Dad now. He's a surveyor, you know. The boy straightened himself up proudly. I'm going to be a surveyor when I'm a man. Dad takes me on little trips like the one we're doing now. He's teaching me to box the compass and run out the chain, and I'm going to begin to get altitudes and right angles and things pretty soon. I can tell you what a hypotenuse is now. Good, there's the supper bell. We must go in. I should like to hear more about you and your dog later. The boy stepped along by my side. I say, are you going over to Arnold Pond? We're going to spend the night there. Hey, Dad, we can all go over to the pond together. I... I don't know your name. I told him. Mine's Rob Randall, and this is Dad, and that's Jim Pearson, the chain-bearer. We're a surveying outfit, and ask him's the most important member. At the table the conversation became general. Bob's father, Dave Randall, was a tall, breezy, refined-looking fellow with a keen, honest blue eye. He had a fund of excellent stories at his command and told them in good English. Easy it was to see where the boy got his fine, fearless manner and his unmistakable air of culture. He was a small copy of the man, and they were evidently great chums. Supper finished, my guide slipped his shoulders into the straps of my pack basket, and we all strolled across the clearing and down into the twilight of the pines. Old gray beards, some of them were. This one precious spot had not yet been despoiled by the lumberman of its primeval beauty. Ask him went ahead, stepped softly, with his nose low. Not capering, he. The business of living was too important. Suddenly he stopped, lowered his nose, sniffed, pointed, and was off down the trail, moving quickly and stealthily. "'He scented something,' said Bob to me. "'Let's go ahead and see what it is.' Around a bend in the trail we found him excited and eager, with his nose pointing toward a clump of fern, and his long homely tail trembling. Bob and I looked carefully. On the ground lay a bit of fur, nothing more. "'Some animal has been killed.' "'Look again,' whispered Bob. "'Close.' I leaned over. Two round eyes looked up out of the middle of the flat gray disk, and then I saw faintly the outline and tips of two pointed ears, laid back so flatly that it was not easy to distinguish them. "'A baby rabbit,' said Bob softly. His mother told him he mustn't move. "'See here.' He stooped over, stroked the soft fur once, twice. Then the bunny's nerve broke, and it jumped deeper under the fern and crouched again. Ask him watched, but made no attempt to touch it. "'Why didn't your dog go for it?' I asked, as we moved up the trail. "'Cause he's a beaver dog. He's trained so. He isn't a butcher. He's just a what-do-you-call locator. He finds the burrows and scents all kinds of game. You see, if a dog catches a beaver, likely he'll spoil the fur, so ask him knows he's not to touch. At the landing we found a boat, and my guide and the chain-bearer, each with an oar, rowed us over to the camp. We shook hands with the man and the woman at the cookhouse, chose our respective log cabins, and then while my guide took the boat back to the landing for the next comer, Bob, Askham, and I, in one of the camp boats, paddled out on the pond in the gathering twilight. On all sides down to the very shore rose great pines, spruces, and hemlocks, with a dark line all around the rim of the pond where the deer in the winter months had nibbled away all the green twigs as high up as they could reach. Askham suddenly began to tremble and gaze off across the water, making now and then a whiffing noise, almost a whisper. He sees something. Watch now. Keep perfectly still and look where he does. Through the pale gold of the western reflection we saw a ripple, then a small head parted the water silently, making for the shadows of the shoreline. There was no sound anywhere, and we held our breath. Suddenly my foot slipped and my boot rasped along the bottom of the skiff. We heard a heavy thud on the water, and the animal was gone. Askham gave me one disapproving glance, and then, splash, he went over the side, heading for the nearest land. "'That was a beaver,' said Bob. "'Didn't you hear his tail slap the water? Askham's gone to find his burrow. There's a big beaver dam down at the outlet, and Dad says there used to be some hutches that they built once long ago.' 
but when they made the camp on the pond the beavers didn't like it and they destroyed their houses and now they live in their burrows on the shore with their doors under water they feel safer that way i suppose ask him will find right where that one lives but no one is allowed to kill beavers here so that old fellow is safe sure enough the dog did locate the burrow and it was with difficulty that we found him and persuaded him to return to the boat i'll keep hold of him now so that he can't get out again said bob he's a wonderful center he can find a burrow under four feet of snow he scents all kinds of things bears wolves lynxes and once it's sort of long but i'd like to tell you dad never tells it himself but he lets me would you like to hear it honest do tell me the moon is coming up and we needn't go in quite yet dad'll call when it's time to turn in well it was most two years ago dad had some surveying to do up north of quebec and he started off with jim pearson and two portagers to carry the duffel and the canoes cause it was to be a very long expedition up through the real wild wilderness ask him when of course he always does he's a very valuable member you see he knows where the game is if they want fresh meat now september was a mighty fine month and they kept going and going and they went farther than they planned at first and they got a long ways up in the woods where the ponds haven't any names and there aren't any trails except injun ones then the cold weather came and it was just nipping everything froze up tight and the snow came very early but they kept on because some of their work was easier to do when the ponds and streams were covered with ice nights they used to find a sheltered place and put up their duck tent dad has a jim dandy little sheet iron stove that is a ripper when it gets going and they'd hive up around it as warm as toast old askham would go to sleep between dad and jim and he was as happy as anything once in a while an indian trapper would come along and dad would send a letter down to montmorency that's where we live and i can tell you mother and i would be the gladdest things in canada when we got those little old leaves torn out of his diary then there was a long time when we never got a word and mother and i sat around waiting and worrying mother got thin and she used to cry a lot i saw her once cry right into the frying pan and the tears sizzled but if she thought i was looking she'd pretended to laugh and talk about what we'd do when dad came back the last letter we got came about thanksgiving time and after that we didn't hear anything more and we never did know about them till they got home way along after new year's and we came mighty near losing dad that time if it hadn't been for but that comes farther along when it got very cold and they had to stow the canoes and go out the rest of the way on foot the portageurs carried the tent and the grub and dad and jim had the compass and chain it kept getting colder and colder and after a while they came to stop working and make camp to keep warm one morning dad and jim started out on their snowshoes with a ask him for a center to see if they couldn't find a caribou or something they needed some fresh meat to help out the grub supply if they had to stay very long they went an awful long way and never found a thing then all of a sudden the sky got gray and there came up a terrible blizzard the kind that freezes the tears on your face and drives needles into you and if you don't look out you get frozen stiff there was only one thing to do they dug a hole in the snow on a slope away from the wind way down to the ground so as to make a hearth for their fire then they made this hole big enough to put in some basalm beds they roofed it all over with basalm boughs so they were quite snug and cozy and the wind could whistle all it wanted to they stayed two days like that till the blizzard was over the bother was that they didn't have anything to eat only a few little pieces of jerked venison that they had carried for the one day's hunting when they crawled out the third morning the world was all white without a break even the trees were great lumps of snow and there wasn't a track anywhere in the storm they had gotten turned around and they didn't know which way to go to find the portagers the compass was at the main camp and the only way they could tell north from south was by the moss on the tree trunks they would just have to let the portageurs find them they all hunted everywhere but there wasn't the teeniest sign of even a squirrel ask him went around smelling into the wind for miles but it was just like all the world was dead that was the time he came so near to getting his toes frozen they thought him out just in time well they kept getting hungrier and hungrier 
Dad and Jim took in their belts till there weren't any more holes, and Ask Him looked thinner than an old starved wolf. I don't know how many days they went hungry. Dad never could tell. He lost count. But they were pretty near the jumping-off place, I can tell you. The lad hugged the wet coat of Ask Him closer to his. Then one day Jim told Dad that they'd have to eat little old Ask Him to save their own lives, and Dad said he'd as soon eat Jim or have Jim eat him. If it came to a question of starving to death, they could just starve, but Ask Him was one of the boys, and Dad hadn't come to be a cannibal yet. Jim used all the suasion he had, but Dad just told him to go chase himself, and he sat down in the snow hole with his hands hanging over his knees, looking at the fire, and he wouldn't speak another word. Then Jim he got desperate, and he told Dad he'd just go out and see if he couldn't find a mink or a muskrat or something on the other side of the hill they were burrowed into. He called Askham, and they went off with a gun and left Dad alone. He got in too weak to hunt any more. Jim was praying all the way that something would turn up, but there wasn't a track or a sign of game, and no hope of finding any. He went off an awful long way, so Dad wouldn't hear anything. It was just a question to Jim of whether all three of them should starve together, or that Askham should die, and he and Dad should live. A sob broke in the boy's throat, and he looked straight into the wise eyes of the dog. "'Ask him, old fellow. Jim was going to kill you, so's Dad and he could eat you and keep alive theirselves a little longer. But he didn't, he didn't. He called you up to him away out there in the wilderness, and he put his finger on the trigger of his gun and tried to pull it, and he couldn't. He trembled so. And he knew if he didn't do it pretty soon, he would never have strength to do it at all. And then he aimed again and he looked along the sights of his gun-barrel at you, and there you were, sniffing, just sniffing at the ground and paying no attention to Jim at all. And then, and then you began digging with your old lean paws, and every little while you would almost tumble over, you were so excited and so weak. But you wobbled along and kept digging deeper and deeper. And then Jim threw down the gun, dropped on his knees, and helped you dig, cause he knew you had scented something and he just prayed that you wasn't going to be fooled, and he dug and dug. Bob turned to me with shining eyes. And what do you think they found? A cache, a big cache left there by some engine. There were pork, beans, peas, flour, tea, enough to keep him for a long time. Well, maybe Jim didn't give Ask him a good hugging, and they gave him some of the pork in little pieces so he wouldn't choke himself. Then he ate some himself, to make strength to get the things back to camp. He toted the grub back with him, and when they got to the snow hole, Dad was still sitting there, not sensing anything, and Jim yelled in his ear, "'Dave, we're saved! Ask him, little old Ask him did it!' They had more than enough to last until the portagers came up and found them, and when they went away they took things from their own duffel and filled the engine's catch fuller than ever and they left a big order for him at the first trading post they passed on their way back. The night when they came home, Mother fainted away, and when she came to, Dad had her in his arms, and Jim was pouring water on her head, and asked him was barking like mad, cause he didn't know what they were doing to her. He likes Mother a heap. "'Bob, time to turn in!' Dave Randall's mellow voice echoed across the water. The boy unbuttoned his coat, put it half around Ask him who was shivering, and silently I paddled the boat up to the silvery moon trail to the little wharf. End of section 9。section 10 of Dog Heroes of Many Lands。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dog Heroes of Many Lands by sarah noble ives jerry a sea dog of the california coast i'll never be able to take that walk around the summit carol my nerves are completely upset i'll be glad enough to get back to detroit again where things are flat and comfortable the scenery is too much on end to suit me oh mother it is so beautiful think of those wonderful pines and redwoods in the muir wood and then think about those little trees we call woods on belle isle I just love it here. Well, maybe you do. You are young. One can be enthusiastic when one is fourteen years old and thin. All I can think of is that little crooked railway that ties itself into double bow knots all up and down the mountain. 
I'm sorry I came. And we've got to toboggan eight miles more to get back to Mill Valley, down those awful curves and precipice places, with nothing but one man and a break between us in perdition. What would happen, I'd like to know, if he should forget to set it, or if the thing should break? I declare I've almost a mind to walk back. Why, dearie mother, it is just as safe as any railroad. Well, you may like Mount Tamalpe if you want to, but I stay in San Francisco until we go south, and that's all hills, too. I lose my breath every time I go shopping. If ever I get down this mountain alive, I'll never risk my bones again on anything but plain steam cars. You won't mind if I go around the top, will you, mother? Oh, I suppose you'll have to. But do be careful. Don't go near the edge. And shut your eyes when you look down. Mrs. Ballin, tourist and pleasure seeker, settled back in an easy chair at the inn on the summit of Mount Tamalpe, making sure that she was where she could not see the edges of things, and proceeded to calm her feelings with a soothing nap. Carol wandered out and left the soft wind toss her hair and rumple her petticoats, while she looked out over the wonderful landscape that lay below and all around. Just like a big raised map, she said aloud. San Francisco Bay and the islands and capes and hills and things? Some day I'm going to live out here. Mill Valley would be a fine place. It's grand down there in the pines, and when I want real air, I can pop up here, where it's all air and blue sky and brown earth and green bushes. The girl wandered off up the path that led to their left around the rocky summit. At a wooden bench by the side of the path, she stopped and seated herself to take in the beauty of the scene. Her heart sang like a bird on a June morning for the sheer joy of living and seeing all this from her first mountain top. She broke a twig from a manzanita bush that grew at her side, just to fill the company of its green leaves in her fingers, and leaned back against the rock, swinging her happy feet and letting her idle glance follow the flight of a solitary bird, dipping and rising, as if he rode on billows of air. You like it? So engrossed was she with the ecstatic soaring of the bird, that she had not noticed an elderly man who had seated himself at the other end of the bench. Now she looked at him. There was something about his solid carriage that commanded respect, something in his gray curling beard and his clear blue eyes that gave her confidence. A line from her favorite poet, she was studying English literature, flew to her head, and she almost said it aloud as she looked at him, eyes grown dim with gazing on the pilot stars. Instead, however, of repeating this or answering his question, she uttered the thought that had come with the verse. You are a sailor, sir? The man laughed. How did you guess, little lady? My uncle is a captain on the lakes. He has eyes like yours. A sailor does get a certain expression, that's a fact. Comes from watching for, rocks off shore, and squalls off sea. Jerry here now. He's got it too. The sea look. For the first time, Carol now saw lying at the end of the bench an Irish setter, elderly too. At the sound of his name, he rose to a sitting posture and looked up affectionately at the man. He was a fine specimen of his breed. His long, narrow head was broad in the forehead and well arched in the cranium. His ears were long, pendulous, and silky. His coat, a mahogany color, was soft and wavy. His whole being bespoke kindness, good sense, and love. His eyes, yes, there was in them, that same long focus, but the brown was dimming, as if already he needed no sharp vision to see the end of his voyage. Oh, is he your dog? I saw him on the car coming up. He's old, isn't he? Yes, yes, he is old, as dogs go. But he's seen life and taken it as it came, like a man. And that's more than some of us do. The sailor looked out over the brown hills for a moment and then went back to his first question. You like it here? Oh, so much. It's all so new and different. Everything is so wide. You can see miles. And it's all blue sky up here. And the country is so soft and brown and hazy. And over there is a bit of the ocean, just a streak beyond the hills, as blue as blue. And right down there over San Francisco and the Golden Gate, it is all a floor of fog, just like rolls of cotton batting. Yes, I know. I know the Pacific in sunshine and in fog. It is queer about California fogs. One side of the bay will be all buried in the mist, and the other out in full sunlight. Something about the coast formation does it. And they come and go, suddenly. The sailor sat still for a moment. Carol's gaze wandered back to the bird, 
that was now soaring in great flights resting on its pinions so long that it seemed as if it must fall then with a rhythmic beat of its wings up it sailed again almost out of sight into the ether the man pointed with his finger to the northwest and the dog at his side seemed to follow and locate the very spot that his master indicated do you see that bit of blue there jerry could tell you something about those waters we've sailed them together many a time and once is jerry a sea dog yes he is that we've been sea dogs together out by that bit of blue now there's a point of land a cape like and offshore are some bird rocks you've seen some of them along the coast no well there are cormorants that come there and on a bright day you can see them on those rocks rows of them with their long black necks stretched out all in the same direction watching for fish and hundreds of gulls too flapping around in shore on one side of the point it is sandy beach and on the other it is rocky in fine weather the waves go sliding in and out treacherous and wicked looking with trails of foam like snakes on their backs beyond the bird rocks are some other rocks that can only be seen at low tide when there's a storm at sea the waves pile up and break over them with a sound like cannon thundering and just as cruel if a ship should get sucked in there and out beyond these there are still other rocks that are never seen it looks fine from here but we've seen it close too jerry and i ay and felt it what's more oh have you really been in a shipwreck carol caught her breath and clasped her hands together ay twas the city of chester she went down off those rocks on as pretty a night as you ever saw and she's lying there now if the storms haven't taken her further out to davy jones's submarine shipyard tell me about it please carol went over to the dog and sat down cross-legged by his side as if he knew a friend at sight jerry laid his nose on her knee and continued looking out toward the bit of blue water well let me see it was thirteen years ago jerry was a month-old puppy two years before that when captain wallace brought him aboard and from that time until she went under jerry was ship dog to the city of chester she ran on the coastline from frisco to vancouver and was as plucky a little steamer as ever lived i was first mate on her and i helped train jerry he was a clipper in those days and he navigated by his own chart entirely anything that wasn't shipshape he'd find and worry so it behooved us all captain and crew to keep our berths tidy grow he grew fifteen knots an hour that first year and everybody got to know him along the line when we hove to in the slip there wasn't a longshoreman anywhere but would yell hello jerry the minute they saw his red head over the handrail when work wasn't pressing they would amuse themselves throwing things in the water for him to bring in there wasn't anything he wouldn't tackle even an empty barrel and he'd tow it into port somehow he was always right at the gangplank when it was let down and he superintended the going ashore of the passengers and the coming aboard of the new ones he never let his eyes off the freight till the stevies had run it all off and stowed the next batch in the hold he loved the winch i set him on a bale of hay once when it was being lowered and he went down into the hold with his paws clutched into the wires and looking worried and puzzled but he came up on a trunk the next trip with an expression like a seraph after that you couldn't keep him away when he heard the hoisting engine start up many a ride he had after that on things that gave him a foothold the whole crew loved him didn't they jerry and he loved the crew the captain and i were close hauled and running even for the, his first favor after us came the cook who had a hold on his heart through his bread basket elsewhere honors were even many a stormy night he walked the bridge with the captain or me according to the watch only turning in when we changed off or one or the other of us went below to get a cup of coffee from the cook's galley or a hot lemonade all the passengers took notice of him and those who made the trip often grew to be quite friends with him one galoot tried to coax him off i was watching unbeknown ready to pounce if need be but no the city of chester was jerry's ship and its crew were his people he had no particular use for landlubbers except to pass the time of day with them he'd go ashore with captain wallace or me 
however and would quite enjoy a little run up geary street or market or along the docks sometimes when we were tied up for loading and i had shore leave i used to bring him up here and those were the times when he nearly went crazy with joy racing through the scrub and chasing squirrels and butterflies and rolling on his back in the dirt he certainly did enjoy a touch of real freedom and it's because of those times that i bring him up here occasionally he's too old now to run but he likes to look off across the hills toward that strip of blue i think he dreams of the city of chester and his life there it was in march nineteen jerry was two years old i remember and a beauty you can see if you are a judge of dogs that he has all the points there came aboard at vancouver a young lady bound for frisco her name was miss frances dewing about your size i should think she was though maybe three or four years older you made me think of her as, as i hove alongside reckon that's why i spoke to you evidently she had a love for dogs and i think there's something wrong with anyone who hasn't she took to jerry like a connoisseur and he knew her for a friend and a good fellow she was the only passenger i ever saw him regularly make up to they made a fine voyage of it together and when we reached frisco it was a toss-up whether he would go with her or stay with us captain wallace gave him the chance just to see and it finally ended up in his leaving her carriage and walking up the gangplank of his own accord but he sat on the deck and howled for about five minutes after she had gone i reckon the captain wouldn't really have let jerry go and i do know he was tickled at the way he chose to stay with us who had brought him up and educated him did he ever see the girl again carol's eyes were bright and eager as she looked up at the sailor man yes indeed and that's the very story i'm coming to she was down at frisco to do some easter shopping and then she spent a week at palo alto and in april she came aboard again to make the trip home jerry nearly wiggled out of his skin with joy when he saw miss doing again and she shook hands with me and the captain as if we were old friends we were due to leave port at eight p m and it was as fine an evening as ever was it was warm hardly a breath of wind and the bay was like glass there was a full moon coming up over oakland and not a cloud anywhere when we swung out through the golden gate we met some rollers coming in that told us there had been a storm somewhere off at sea they were high enough so we had to shut the portholes to larboard but on the starboard side everything was as cozy as a back parlor all the passengers that had any sea legs at all were cuddled about watching the moon and this tamalpe but there are always a few who take to their berths first thing on principle we were steaming along in a fine fettle miss doing was leaning against the rail watching the shore when jerry and i strolled along she called to him and he went over to be patted and i followed we stood there and she asked me a lot of questions about the fairy gardens under seas in these parts ever been out in the glass bottom boats at monterey or catalina no well don't go back east without doing that it's another world the waters along those california shores are washing over a wonder of palm groves and waving kelp with big round shiny heads and every kind and color of seaweed and there are purple and crimson sea urchins pretty enough to pet if they weren't so prickly and starfish and anemones and abalones and big fishes sailing along slow waving their tails as if they were seaweed too i'll bet anything if we could look down into some of the places where they haven't been scared away we'd see shoals and shoals of mermaids and mermen too disporting themselves as happy as the fishes well i was telling miss dooling all about these things when i saw some long gray fingers beginning to reach up across the sky out of the southwest then whole handfuls came sweeping up and in next to no time the moon and the land were gone and we were lost in one of those sudden low fogs that come up out of nowhere along the coast so thick it was you could see where your breath made a hole in it it came so quickly that the passengers stopped talking and left their mouths hanging open it was as if we had been shut off from the whole of creation swaying there mid seas on those long slow rollers our visible points of reckoning were cut off without a warning and we were none too far from shore captain wallace rang orders to the engine room to slow down and the boatswain started to take soundings in a minute the forward watch shouted 
breakers to starboard and the ship was swung a bit to port we were just off the bird rocks when the fog closed in and had been running rather close to shore to gain time in the fine weather just that little minute when we lost our bearings did the mischief before we could get out of our gate there was a lurch and a tearing sound down in the innards of the ship and then she righted herself but with a list as if she was nursing a wound one of those submerged rocks had stabbed her then for a minute a lunatic asylum wasn't in it the passengers all came shrieking to know what had happened and the captain left me in command on deck while he went below to see what had really been done she had slipped clear of whatever hit her and when the captain came up he looked mighty grave he said to me slow and quiet get out the life belts and clear away the boats quick in a minute the whistle was shrieking harder than the foghorn and rockets were shooting up there wasn't any wireless then but we did the best we could land was near and the lanes of oversea travel not so many miles away help would come soon and we needed it soon there was a whole stove in the starboard forward keel that meant about one hour left to us barely that the captain and i did what we could to keep the passengers quiet and they acted better than some would but there were things done that night that any man or woman ought to be ashamed of and would have been if they had kept their heads the life belt didn't go round steamers weren't fitted up as well as they were since the titanic disaster some people grabbed from others and there were fighting at the boats which it took the captain and me and the clerk and the head steward to put a stop to so we could load in the women and children as the last boat we had only four was being swung off the davits i saw miss dewing standing watching them very quiet quick i yelled there's just room they were helping in a little bride who was sobbing because her husband couldn't go there was one more place and i started to lift miss dewing in but she stepped back and said let that little wife have her husband i can swim and i am used to cold water in spite of my arguments she refused and i saw her draw herself up and look off into the mist calm and quiet as i lowered her away a man came rushing from the companionway stark mad with fear he tried to leap into the boat which was already full to the limit the captain grabbed him amidships and there was a struggle the man fought like a wild animal before any one could slip a hand to stop him both he and the captain were over the side still struggling i saw them when they came to the surface saw the crazy man strike the captain a blow that knocked him senseless and he fell clear and sank and we never saw him again then i knew that the command of the ship must fall to me and whatever happened i was captain until she went down not that i cared for the promotion coming in just that way the boats were clear now and the chester was settling fast people with life belts and anything they could find were leaping over the side to get away from the suction we could hear the faint sound of a whistle out of the murk far away something was coming to our assistance but it would be too late for some all this time jerry had been running up and down as excited as any one and trying to understand what the trouble was he ran from man to man of the crew then to me again and finally when the boats were all gone he found miss dewing standing very still by the rail seeing him she stooped and kissed him and put her hand on his head as if he was a comfort to her i hustled around and found an extra life belt and stepped up and told her to put it on you'd better jump i said and get clear of the ship she'll be under in ten minutes drop your shoes and your heavy petticoats this she did as calmly as if she were going in swimming then with a clear jump as if she were used to it she was gone i could see her striking out with slow even strokes away from the ship and into the fog jerry looked up at me and would have gone over after her but i said selfish i think now jerry old man we're in command we stand by the ship and go down together we were alone now and the deck was almost on a level with the water it's a queer feeling one has standing so still and so near death it's a lonesome feeling too and yet i thought then we have to go alone anyhow and what better and cleaner place than the old pacific it was good to have jerry there though i can tell you 
just to feel his old red muzzle in my hand heartened me then all at once the chester gave a curious shake a tremble like hoisted her stern and slid to her everlasting grave down in the kelp gardens jerry and i went down in the suck and i was whirled over and over and inside out and upside down till my breath was fairly gone and finally in a fountain of bubbles i popped up gasping and spluttering when i got my breath back i saw through the mist not far away there was light enough from the moon above the fog old jerry shaking the water out of his eyes and settling into a stroke then i made out here and there gray dots there were dozens of people all struggling in the water in such cries god i never want to hear them again now and then one would gasp and go under i lighted on a bench that had come up and pushed it along to where two or three people were about exhausted and i told them to hold on till help came then i said to jerry who was swimming alongside go find miss doing instantly he turned and headed off in a different direction i followed for i had a feeling that he would find her by this time i had my senses so i realized that the noise that had been in my ears ever since i came up was the blast of a steamer's whistle and in a space of time that seemed like an eternity but was really very short a great hole loomed out of the fog the oceanic it was who heard us bound for honolulu and a sweep of searchlight crept over the water where we were huddled then the boats already lowered dropped into the sea and darted toward us the fog was clearing now so they could see us and one by one the poor chilled shivering exhausted things were picked up some were dead and floating in their life belts others just alive nowhere could i see jerry all at once someone cried from the deck of the oceanic look there's a dog save him too i turned my head and saw on the crest of a long swell jerry old jerry towing something that he held tightly in his teeth it was miss doings's little red sweater and little miss doing herself was inside it but unconscious he never let go till he was alongside the lifeboat and they had lifted her in it then one of the men reached and pulled him in too and pretty soon they had us all all who were still on top and we were taken aboard the oceanic and we were rubbed and dosed with hot drinks and rolled in blankets until such of us pulled through had got to be human beings once more and that's the end of the story carol slipped her arm over the old dog's neck and sat silent a moment what became of miss doing up in vancouver married one of the survivors and has three fine children the oldest is a girl almost your size she begged hard for jerry miss doing did and i put it up to him as his own master and he chose me again it's a life on the ocean way for jerry i've been captain of my own ship since then for ten years and every time we run into vancouver i go to call on the little lady it was christmas dinner last year and it's to be thanksgiving this fall if we can make it when i retire i've promised to run into harbor there and jerry yes said carol softly and jerry jerry will be sailing the uncharted ocean then i've promised him a burial at sea with honors where the chester sank over there in that bit of blue carol carol come back it's time to start that is mother calling thank you for the story i won't forget it yes mother i'm coming good-bye good-bye jerry the bird in the air was not alone now there were two wheeling and calling to each other now they dipped down swiftly and disappeared in the shadows of a grove of live oaks end of section ten recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america Section 11 of Dog Heroes of Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Dog Heroes of Many Lands by Sarah Noble Ives. Chapter 11. Tom, a dog of the Eastern States. When Tom first came to Mr. Allison's, he was a little, black, curly-haired puppy, without a hint of white on his whole coat, his tail was not so plumy then, but it gave good promise, even in those days, of being his glory. 
you would never have dreamed that he would grow to weigh a hundred pounds or more as he does now he gave promise too of being a great many things he was as full of life as a pod is of peas fairly overflowing with wriggling activity the children don and mary attempted to keep him in the house for their very own when he was small but he set his tiny teeth into everything in sight and played such havoc with the window curtains and rugs that they were finally compelled to turn him over to amos the hired man for he was versed in dog lore and able the better to train him amos it must be confessed plotted for his favor from the beginning he knew that there is nothing in the world so safe to tell your secrets to so charitable to your shortcomings so ready in sympathy for your troubles as a dog so when the puppy made mincemeat of the upholstering on the drawing-room sofa and was given to the tender mercies of the grizzled old servant amos looked very serious but in his heart of hearts he blessed the unfortunate sofa and carried the winsome scapegrace off to the barn now tom you little villain i'm not going to punish you one mite instead i'm going to give you something of your own to cut your baby teeth on lord knows you've got to cut em somehow now this here bit of old harness is just the ticket and it's yours and the rest of the straps and things lying around are mr allison's and when this is all chewed up you can come to me for something else now mind amos dropped an old bridle on the floor near by and watched with one eye the puppy settled down to his own strap and in due time it was reduced to its component atoms amos went out to attend to some other duties and when he returned the bridle lay untouched and tom sidled up to an appeal for more strap he seemed to catch the spirit of thine and mine and never again destroyed anything that he did not know was his an old broken saddle was the joy of his young life it took him some time to obliterate its shape and comeliness in fact he was almost over the destructive age before he got all the buckles loose and the tough leather torn to tatters when the horsehair stuffing was scattered to the four winds and the last bit of wood and iron unscrewed and taken apart tom looked up from the wreck with the joy of a duty well done he had never had a whipping and never needed one if amos accidentally trod on his tail he would wag it to show that there was no hard feelings if his paw was stepped on tom held it up to be coddled it was curious that he was not spoiled but a thing that is solid all through can't be spoiled the whole family hung on his eyelids dawn and mary looked upon tom as their own and with amos to help he was taught many tricks he seemed to learn them just by looking at you he would fetch anything dawn threw for him on land or in the water dawn would throw a stone in the pond and he would go in and fetch the identical stone once however the stone dawn threw was so small that tom could not find it he stayed down so long that even amos became frightened at last he came up and looked at dawn as if to say no use then down he went again and came up with the biggest stone that he could possibly carry and laid it at dawn's feet looking so sheepish that everybody laughed but tom had to be comforted for he was ashamed at his failure but games were not all of life to tom as he grew to dog's estate he proved himself helpful in many ways when he was about a year old amos handed him the basket containing mr allison's lunch it was sometimes sent to his office in the village when he was too busy to come home tom said amos take mr allison's dinner to him and mind you don't eat it yourself nor drop it take it to mr allison tom looked amos in the eye keenly and understandingly then he clinched his teeth in the basket handle turned tail and trotted off down the street it was not far about half a mile amos followed to see if he had really understood but tom went so rapidly that he was out of sight before amos had turned the last corner there he met the dog coming back but he did not stop to greet amos right past he went and straight home to mrs allison to whom his master had charged him to deliver a note after that he always went with the lunch amos followed a few times and never but once did tom set it down on this occasion just before he turned into main street he saw a dog fight in progress there was a ring of little hoodlums and in the centre a mongrel bull was tackling a fox terrier about half his size it was not an equal fight and it never should have been allowed but those soulless imps were whooping and yelling in unholy glee the bull had the fox by the throat and was choking his life out it was not fair play amos started on a run to stop the tragedy but tom was ahead and he jumped into the thick of it he caught that mongrel bull and thrashed daylight into him and the bull crawled off limping with his tail between his legs like the cur he was amos wound up the affair with a tongue lashing for the imps and when he had seen that the fox was coming to and able to get to his feet he looked for tom 
but tom was already at mr allison's office carrying the basket as if nothing at all had happened every morning tom met the letter carrier halfway and when there were letters he would come tearing back to mrs allison and give them to her but if there were none he would drag his feet home as if they were shod with lead every evening he would race to the post office as soon as the train came in to be the first to get the paper the postmaster never kept tom waiting and he would be back on the porch before any one would believe it possible i said every night no not quite sundays at the same hour he would lay as peacefully on the porch as the birds in their little nests and mr allison could say paper to him as many times as he liked tom would simply look at him out of the corner of his eye until his master was fairly ashamed of trying to deceive a dog who apparently was the more intelligent of the two his great delight was to assist amos in driving the cows to pasture and back tom watched every move that amos made until he had mastered the whole method then one morning he astonished the old man by opening the gate himself he did this from the inside pushing back the bolt and throwing his weight on the crossbar after that amos taught him to open it from the other side in a week he had learned to jump up put his paw over the bar and pull the bolt then he would poke his nose through the crack and wriggle until he could swing the gate open after that he had things his own way going and coming and amos had only to potter along and enjoy the sunset then one day amos was busy in the stable with a sick horse and he said to tom run along tom and get the cows tom waved his tail understandingly and was off when amos came out and looked across the meadow there was tom coming with the cattle there was a place too where a length of fence was down between the lane and the corn and the cows would fain have turned in and helped themselves to a juicy ear or two but no tom herded them past not giving them the ghost of a chance he had left the gate into the cow-yard open and while amos watched those cows were driven in and tom shut the gate after them after that farming was easy for amos and as long as tom enjoyed it why not amos would say tom go and get frank and tom was off hot foot to the pasture where he would pick out the big carriage horse and drive him up to the stable if amos told him to bring pet up came the little mare there was no longer any bothersome chasing around the lot with a fight to get the bridle on just to see the horse dodge and turn up at the far end of the enclosure tom corralled them and the rest was easy mrs allison could never have brought up her family without tom he was nursemaid in extraordinary to don and mary after the baby came the busy mother had little time to follow the older ones around and one day she said tom keep an eye on don and mary he never left them if they went near the well it was no no tom was in between if don climbed a tree he waited underneath as if he expected to catch him if he fell whatever they did they had to answer to tom one day when don was about seven and mary four the children without consulting their mother planned a little expedition to the woods the nuts were falling and the temptation was great don laid in a store of cookies from the jar in which mrs allison kept a harmless between meal variety thus provisioned with his pockets full and more in mary's sunbonnet off they went tom was with amos in the garden and was not invited to the party down the road they went before any one missed them then amos heard their mother calling here and there up attic and down cellar and in the chicken yard soon with the baby on her arm she came down to the garden and said in a frightened voice amos have you seen don and mary no mrs allison amos i'm afraid they are lost i haven't seen them for an hour or so i've been so busy helping sarah make pickles now mrs allison don't you worry we'll find them if they're to be found come tom tom was up like a shot all attention tom said amos go and find don and mary oh tom find them please said mrs allison find don and mary he looked at her then at amos and then with a woof he was off down the road straight toward the woodlot amos followed and just as he turned in under the big hickories by the bars he saw the youngsters coming back along the tote road that runs through the wood to the swamp lot tom was hurting them and they couldn't have stepped out of the road to save their lives mary was crying because she had dropped her cookies and wasn't allowed to go back for them don was greatly excited amos he cried there's a big man stealing our nuts and he was up a tree shaking them down and i said to him get down out of our tree those are our nuts and i stamped my foot just like that and the man laughed and said i was a shaver and went right on shaking the tree and i told mary to help me and we picked up a lot they were papa's nuts anyway and the man said leave those nuts alone or i'll cut your heads off and he got down out of the tree and mary began to cry and i was scared but i didn't cry 
and then all of a sudden right between us and the man was old tom he just growled something awful and showed his teeth and he gave one nip at the man and he ran like there was a dragon after him and then tom made us come straight home and we couldn't bring the nuts cause we had to keep going when the baby was big enough to be intelligent she followed after the family in her adoration of tom he would let her tumble all over him and pull his black woolly coat he would stand perfectly still with the exception of his tail and let her creep under him and he would lie like a foolish bit of marble and let her scramble over him laughing and pulling his ears or falling asleep between his friendly paws when little martha was something more than a year old there came one of those mellow autumn days when the creeping things that hibernate come out to have a last look at nature amos was bringing in a load of pumpkins when he saw mary and don running toward him screaming with terror hello kids what's after you the bees mary's fat little legs gave out and down she went in the road but with breath enough left to keep screaming don kept on until he reached the side of amos's load it's a snake a big snake he gasped he's eating up the baby he was so big i didn't dare kill him and we saw you hurry he's in the front yard hurry you may believe that amos lost no time he left the pumpkins and the horses and went sixty miles an hour around the corner of the house there sat the baby calm as a lily and just about a yard in front of her stood tom very much interested in something amos gave one look and then dropped on the ground with his arms around the dog praising the lord and seeing that tom got his full share there lay the snake and it was a rattler thirteen rattles and a button and all dead as a doorknob amos picked up the baby and started for the kitchen tom gave the rattler one more shake for good luck and then trotted along as if nothing had happened but it was at the fire that tom earned his everlasting glory no one knew exactly how it started probably it was the kitchen flue for it was saturday night and there were beans baking everybody was abed and asleep about three in the morning one of those still nights when smoke settles heavily and sounds do not carry far amos in his loft over the stables awoke to a dream of folks shouting and dogs barking rubbing his eyes he saw a bright light dancing on the wall opposite the window and then with it all he heard a crackling sound and he came broad awake he did not wait to go down the ladder but dropped hand over hand down the rain spout and in half a minute was in the thick of it and it wasn't until afterward that he learned why the whole family had not been caught in the flames and destroyed as the house was tom always slept in the kitchen when the fire which had evidently been smouldering in the back bricks of the chimney burst through the walls and into the kitchen tom was the first to know it he went immediately into action there was a swinging door into the dining room and the rest of the house was open and easy of access into the front hall and up the front stairway he went like a mad thing running up and down barking and pawing at the bedroom doors where he could get in he pulled at the bedclothes whining and barking all the time everyone in the house was awake and hustling in no time mr and mrs allison seized don and mary and little martha and out into the dooryard they went in their little nighties sarah the maid went out over the shed roof by this time the neighbors were all arriving garbed hastily and sketchily and everybody turned to the business of saving what they could of the furniture and clothing mrs allison took great care to save the flat irons in her china teapot and the mirrors and pictures that the good neighbors threw out of the windows created a wreckage that seemed unnecessary but in reality a good deal was saved for the fire had not made much headway before tom discovered it and tom when he saw everyone rushing around became busy as the busiest he began carrying out shoes and slippers and anything he could lay his teeth into he realized the seriousness of the occasion and did his duty according to his idea of the situation all this time the smoke was pouring out of the windows room after room lit up with the window panes breaking and shattering in the heat then spurts of fire and smoke came through the roof crackling and sputtering in the dry shingles the walls leaned trembled and with a roar as if the house were one great sugar barrel on the fourth of july the flames shot skyward and the whole structure caved in a few minutes more and nothing was left standing but parts of two chimneys and a few rafters red like molten iron these too soon sank and there was nothing but a mass of coals ready to get breakfast over the village engine like many other village engines arrived on the scene just as the framework collapsed the fire company were bright and shiny in their red shirts and glazed headgear and they looked the more resplendent in contrast with the huddling shivering dew-wet smoke-blackened neighbors but they were too late and nobody cheered them tom old tom was running from one to another of the family whining and forlorn as a lost soul he tried hard to tell them that he had done his best 
and just as dawn was beginning to break through and everybody looked at everybody else and realized his own unlovely appearance and that things were over and couldn't be helped it came over mrs allison that her three children were tucked away safely in a neighbor's bed and her husband was safe and she and sarah and tom and if tom had not awakened us she said we should all have been burned in our beds we owe our lives to him and the babies are safe and the house doesn't matter hurrah for old tom shouted amos three cheers for him hip hip the crowd burst out with a hearty cheer that shook down the last bricks on the last chimney tom did not know what it meant but he cheered as loudly as the others which set every one to laughing then they all took one look around the comical smoke-grimed circle and started home mr allison it may be of interest to mention received full insurance for the house and a new home went up over the ashes of the old and tom who was loved and respected before came in for a share of adoration and gratitude to which dogs seldom attain the allisons wouldn't give him away for a marble palace End of section 11section 12 of dog heroes of many lands this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org dog heroes of many lands by sarah noble ives chapter 12 bruce a fire dog of new york you'll have to take him in if i bide myself said james mcmurray engine company number looked on with much interest as the captain addressed the unusual applicant a man six feet two in his red woolen socks with a shock of red hair nearly as incendiary as the footwear and with scotland written all over him by his side watching the chief expectantly stood the bonniest highland collie that ever waved a friendly tail his glossy black coat was set off by a collar and waistcoat of tan and he was as beautiful as his master was big and brawny mowbray didn't mention the dog when he spoke of you but if the men don't object i don't he looks like a good specimen you'll not find a better bruce has been with me upwards of two year and a finer herder you'll not find in new jersey the chief laughed there won't be much herding to do in the fire department unless you can teach him to herd the crowds and keep em out from under our feet at a blaze and he won't find them lambs to handle either it's the fine mascot he'll be making jim callahan spoke from the depths of the room where he was polishing the engine brasses there's one of the men to speak for himself said captain warner we'll make a try at taking him on and see how it goes what did you say his name was robert bruce mcmurray and it's a fit name he's a king among collies no doubt as to his nationality at any rate laughed the captain so bruce became a member of engine company number and the stock farm in new jersey where his master had trained him knew him no more instead of herding sheep and cattle he had to learn to avoid teams in the rushing whirl of new york traffic it was difficult and at first he was dazed by the never-ending pell-mell of it but he was young and he soon forgot the quiet meadows and the lazy cattle and learned to love the hurly-burly the roar and rattle of wheels on the pavements the shriek of the brakes on the elevated and the steady tireless hum of the great hive following his master's example he settled down into the daily routine of the station as well as into the hearts of the fire laddies they were a fine set of men those big strong chaps with the courage of heroes to do and die in times of danger and the tenderness which grew out of their trade of life-saving the captain looked upon his company with great pride and he as well as some of the others had tucked away with their treasures medals for courage in action james mcmurray hugged himself for pleasure at the thought that fortune had thrown him among men of his own kind as for bruce his life in new jersey had given him a love for horses and who did not love those magnificent specimens formerly found in new york's engine houses now gone alas before the inrush of auto trucks and engines bruce certainly divided his allegiance between the men and the four-footed heroes 
and gave to the latter his special attention. He saw to it three times a day that they were properly fed and watered. He superintended their rubbing down and grooming, and sanctioned, by a wag of his tail, the preparation of their beds at night. The rest of the work of the engine-house was also performed under his eye of approval. The big brass engine could never have been kept in such a state of shining radiance without Bruce as overlord. Tim Callahan laughed as he swabbed on the polish and rubbed it down. "'Sure now, Bruce, and what'd you be doing to me if I forgot to shine one of those nuts? You'd herd me back and make me do my work over again, I'll be bound.' and as for Pete Tinkum there, he never in all his life bullied that floor to the extent he has since we had a mascot to our names, Glory B. It was a grand day when you dropped into our midst, James McMurray, you son of a Scotch thistle. So the ordinary doings of the day passed, with much rough good-humored banter. Evenings the men sat around in a room on the upper floor of the engine-house, telling stories, reading, or playing cards. The room would have passed muster and taken a prize in any company of New England housewifely products, so spandy clean it was. The row of white iron bedsteads were a joy to see, with their covers turned down all at the same angle. On the floor, by the side of each one, stood a pair of rubber boots with soles so thick that the wearer might slosh about freely in the neighborhood of the hydrant with no fear of wet feet. Also, he might trample over broken glass and never risk a puncture. Fastened to the boots were a pair of heavy trousers, made so that a fireman, waking to the alarm in the night, had only to step into the whole contraption and pull the fastening straps up over his shoulders. Coats and helmets were hung on the engine and hose cart to be donned when under way, thus reducing to a minimum the time for dressing. At night, Bruce slept at the foot of McMurray's bed, with one ear cocked for the fire alarm, and when it rang, no matter what the day's weariness might have been, Bruce was down the stair and at his post before the quickest man among them could slide down the pole, or the horses, released automatically from their stalls, could leap to their places. It was a sight worth seeing as he barked and capered apparently sure that the harness could not have dropped to its place and been buckled on by the first man down had he not been there to bark his orders. When the great doors swung open and the engine leaped out, Bruce took his place under it, or as near under as the shower of sparks and coals would permit, and to the scene of action he galloped, as did the horses, as faithful to the fiery monster as its own belching smoke. He grew to have a real passion for a fire. Daytime or nighttime, it was always the same. Where the engine went, there went Bruce, certain that no blaze could be quenched without him. People of the neighborhood grew to look for the black wraith that moved like the very shadow of the engine. The hose cart he did not favor at all, even when his master rode thereon. The sparks that singed his coat never made him swerve from his allegiance to the brass fire-devil. The small boys watched him rapturously, and a night call would find more than one pajama-clad worshipper looking out of a window to see the fire-dog. Daytimes they lingered enviously around, as near the engine as the rules allowed. But they could only adore from a distance. The law of the engine company forbade familiarity with small boys and Bruce was a keeper of the law. He might wave his brush amiably if a particularly enticing whistle attracted his attention, but never did his wooers win him from the straight and narrow path. The fire-dog remained as aloof and inspiring as the big engine itself. Now, there are fires and rumors of fires a many in New York City but with most of them the prompt dash and the finely trained equipment brings the danger to an end in its very beginnings. Occasionally, however, a fire will work out of sight and does not disclose itself until it has made good headway. Then it means a stiff fight and no recess for all hands, even to save adjoining buildings. Sometimes, too, a fire will start in highly combustible material and then look out 
the red demons leap and clutch everything in sight, and even a hurry call to every company within range fails to check the flames. This is what happened on a windy autumn night. A big paper factory on 11th Avenue caught fire in the basement, and the flames went racing and howling skyward, gutting floor after floor, till the whole place was a seething flame. It was not a case of saving the building itself, that was doomed from the first upflying spark, but of keeping the fire from spreading. Calls were sent in for all the available engines in the district. It was a wild scene, the flames leaping and roaring, the streams of water going bravely into the red furnace, only to issue forth again in clouds of steam and vapor. The network of rubber serpents, each manned at the nozzle by sweating, helmeted heroes, the shouting and howling of the crowd, as floor after floor disappeared in the dragon's mouth, the yells of the firemen as they popped out of neighboring skylights and proceeded to wet down the roofs that were dangerously near. It was pandemonium. And through it all the only quiet things were the horses. Quivering with excitement, they stood at their posts, waiting only the word of command that meant time for the drenched and weary men to be taken home. The mad fury of the fire held every man, however, gritting his teeth over his special duty. In the turmoil, Pete Tinkham, who drove the engine that night for company number, Bruce's engine, did not see that the fire was beginning to blaze at the corner of the block where his horses stood. No one noticed. The heat grew fiercer and fiercer. And then, the horse nearest the flames, quietly and without a moan, dropped in his tracks. No one saw but Bruce, who, as usual during a fire, remained in charge of his engine. Surely it was wrong that a horse, one of his horses, should die. Bruce darted toward a man who was toiling along with a great flapping hose, and tried to get his attention. He did not even look at the dog. He tried the chief, whom he knew, but the chief only said, Back, Bruce, out of the way. From man to man he ran, vainly trying to get their attention. Then out of a black doorway came Pete Tinkham, waving an axe and looking wildly for a spare man to help him on the roofs, where a new blaze was starting. Poof! He was nearly knocked flat by the rush of the dog, who leaped upon him, barking and pawing him frantically. Pete stopped. This was unusual in Bruce, who had hitherto behaved himself so well when the company was in action. "'For the love of Mike, what are ye up to?' said Pete, as he righted himself. Bruce dropped to the ground and turned toward his engine, then looked back at Pete and barked. "'What's wrong, I say?' Then Pete looked and saw the fallen horse, just in time to save the others who were slowly suffocating. And after that, roofs might burn for all of Pete, with his beloved horses dying at their post. He lost no time in getting them to a place of safety. And there was mourning that night at Engine House Number, for a good horse fallen, and there was rejoicing, too, because of a dog who had proved himself a fit companion of heroes. At another fire, also, Bruce became a life-saver. A tenement on 20th Street, packed with human beings, caught fire, and for hours every nerve of every man in every company on the spot was strained almost to the breaking point. People hurled themselves from windows into nets. People climbed down gutter spouts, or dropped themselves hand over hand, from cornice to blind, from blind to window sill, and so to safety, or death on the pavement below. One mother went mad for a moment, and refused to give up her baby to the fireman on the ladder, whereupon mother and child were seized bodily and carried shrieking to the ground. It was a fire with more smoke than flame, and the halls and stairways were so choked with the black fumes that it took the most dogged courage of the pluckiest men to go in and find the beings huddled behind doors or lying where they had fallen at the very window sills. The firemen could not stay long at the work. 
they were compelled to come out to save their own lives, leaving others to go on with the task. One more dash, and the last room would be searched, and every one still living would be out of the building. The fire, too, was getting under control, but the smoke was still dense and awful. In the death-filled atmosphere, James McMurray and Cummings, with a no longer needed hose, groped their way along the hall of the second floor to the landing. In the general melee, the railing had been broken, and McMurray, not knowing this, reached out to find it, overreached himself, stumbled, and fell head foremost into the hall below. As he fell, he put out a hand, caught at the edge of the landing, and thus broke the fall, but at the same time swung himself in under the staircase where he lay, stunned and alone, in the reek of smoke. It could not have been for long, for he would have been quite smothered. Cummings, who was ahead, made his way to the blessed air, unaware of the fact that his working-mate had fallen. The worst was over. Captain Warner hastily counted his staff. "'Where's McMurray?' "'He went in with me after that hose,' said Cummings. "'He was right behind. Didn't he come out?' No one had seen him. In after him, boys. He won't be higher than the second floor. Lucky, said Cummings. The other stairways are broken. Up to the second landing groped two men, feeling with their feet all over the darkened hallways. Nobody there. Nobody in the room. No one in the hall below. The men returned to their mates. Can't find him. We'll have to get the ladder for that third story. Hark! Captain Warner lifted his hand. A dog was barking inside the tenement. Now a black collie appeared at the door, gave an impatient yelp, and disappeared again. I'll warrant he's found the boy, cried Callahan. After the dog he dashed, and in a minute he reappeared, bearing the unconscious body of McMurray. Give him fresh air, said the captain, pushing back the crowd. He needs it bad. He's not dead, though. Aye, I'm all right, said McMurray, lifting himself dizzily on his elbow. How did you find me in the smoke? Bruce found you. You were under the staircase, where no sane fireman would ever think of falling. How the dog smelled you in that smoke passes me. Well, said McMurray, as he sat up and rubbed his bruises, Bruce is a real canny dog. I dare be saying he'd find me in, in Mount Vesuvius, said Captain Warner, laughing. Aye, said James McMurray, solemnly, stumbling to his feet, or in the bottomless pit. For three January days in the year of 1890, New York City had been lost in as wild a snowstorm as even the bravest cares to face. Side streets were blocked and almost impassable. Even Fifth Avenue, with the biggest effort of the street cleaners, could only boast a bit of sidewalk and two narrow roadways. Flanking a long, drawn-out Mont Blanc that stretched from Washington Square to Mount Morris Park. Then, on the fourth day, the dawn broke clear. Breathing out of the north a wind with an icicle edge to it, a wind that bit into exposed faces and fingers until they cried out for mercy, a wind that pounced upon Harlem, and two minutes later was seeping across the battery and the bay. It sent the work of the cleaners whirling again in great, unmanageable masses. It shrieked around the casements and ate into the hearts of the houses until the janitors, even the stingiest, were fain to pile the coal high in the furnaces to save their own skins, and woe betide the unlucky who dwelt where furnaces were not. And thereby hung a tale for the firefighters, chimneys stuffed with soot and overheated, red-hot kitchen stoves that sat the chimney cupboards stewing until they sprang into flames. Imperfect flues. The firemen can tell you the list of causes that force them out to fight harder than ever in the bitterest weather. So it was now. All day the alarms kept ringing, and blaze after blaze was fought at odds and with grim desperation. It was a hard day, and at nightfall, when the men on duty at engine-house number 
sat down to a supper brought in to them, that they might be on hand for a quick call. They did so with fervent prayers that they might be spared further labor, for they were spent. It was snug and cozy in the little upper room that evening, despite the wild wind. But outside the gale was rising, and when Callahan reported that the mercury was sitting in the bulb, Bergora, with his hands and feet folded out of sight, every one shuddered and turned in for the night with extra blankets and not even an ear left out for the alarm. Bruce got a blanket of his own, and McMurray was considered the lucky man to have such a hot water bag to his feet. Sleep, well earned, settled down on all. But it rang, oh yes, hardly had the most case-hardened got his first forty winks when a call came, and a hurry call, and a double call for all hands and the cook. The indicator told them that the fire was near Madison Avenue, at the big stables. Clang, clang, clang! The horses bounded to their places. The harness leaped to their backs. The men were booted down the pole and struggling into their coats along the running board of the hose cart before you could mention John, the son of Robin. You'll have to bide at home tonight, Bruce, said McMurray as he swung to his place on the engine. It's too cold a blast for them, as has no need to go out. Bruce's tail dropped to zero and he stepped back a pace. "'Bide at home!' shouted McMurray, as the doors flew open, and the engine, spitting and belching and chugging, was drawn into the bleak, wind-swept snowdrifts. "'Bide at home!' he yelled as they turned a corner. Bruce stayed his feet until the rumble and clangor grew faint. Then the ruling passion became too strong. "'A fire! And he not there to guard his engine? Impossible!' Better would it be to disobey James McMurray than to let his engine perish, and shame come upon company number. Down the street went a black collie, plunging and burrowing his way through the eddying drifts, now galloping faster, where the street had been partly cleared. When the scene of the fire was reached, Bruce, a little breathless but still in the ring, was trotting at the tail of his own particular charge. McMurray saw him but this was no time for lessons in morals. The stables were burning fiercely, and there were thirty-five horses to be saved. To the song of the north wind, the fire added its crackle and roar. Already it had gained terrific headway. A dull red smoke poured from the blistered and broken windows. Tongues of flame shot from the roof. The whole upper loft was one blazing mass and the flying clouds above reflected the strange, unearthly light. Water was of no avail. It froze as it struck the building, and fell in great hissing icicles into the flames. The lower story was covered with a great casing of ice. In that awful cold, the elements failed to destroy each other. And underneath all this horror were thirty-five horses, whinnying, trembling, suffocating and paralyzed with fear some of the firemen worked with the stable hands to get the horses out before the flooring should fall and engulf them when those heavy beams gave way there was not a moment to be lost hastily blinding the horses eyes with blankets the men led them one by one bucking and plunging out into the street twelve they had saved and had returned for more when that unaccountable desire for the protection of their own roof seized the liberated beasts. There was a wild rush, the horses knocking down firemen and every obstacle. Panic seized those that were being let out, and they broke away violently. In one moment all were back again under the roaring furnace of the loft. A cry of anguish went up from the crowd that swayed and surged along the line of fighting police fire mad yes all of them and now who would dare go in after them already the flames were licking between the boards above them and the roof was tottering when that fell the hole would go firemen dropped hose and axes and tried to force them back no use the smoke in the stables was so dense that nothing could be there long and breathe james mcmurray battled desperately with a great cart horse but it was blinded and insane from fright and absolutely unmanageable. 
something on four feet went galloping past McMurray, after the horse he had vainly tried to save, something black with a collar of tan and a waving tail. Now from the stables rang out a dog's bark, strong, clear, insistent. Bruce! gasped McMurray. Fire mad too, the little devil, said Callahan with a sob in his smoke-dried throat. Head him off, you rascals, he called to the quaking stable hands. He'll burn with the bunch. Speak soft, man, said James McMurray, grasping the Irishman by the shoulder, for Callahan was about to dive into the death trap. Hold your wits and look. Look, man, don't you see the bonny laddie? He's herdin' em. He's herdin' the horses like sheep, and they dare not disobey. He's bitin' their heels now. Look how they mind him. "'Glory be!' whispered Callahan, as if afraid of breaking the spell. "'Will you see the likes of that? He's doing what no man would dare do.' The crowd had stopped shouting. The roar of the wind and the flames went on, but every human heart stood still. Out they came. Two, four, six, ten, twenty horses. Dazed with the smoke, helpless with fear, but fear now of a thing that barked and bit their heels unceasingly, and would not let them rest. Lastly came a black collie, herding them carefully. No chance for one to turn back. They must go on, goaded relentlessly. Still the crowd kept silent. Has he got them all? No, but he's saved twenty. Likely the others are suffocated with the smoke. On they went. Then, as the cold struck them, the horses looked back at their burning home and paused. Would they rush again? Yes. No. Robert Bruce McMurray, with his stock farm training, keen, quick, sharpened to the task, never gave them a loophole. Barking, biting, jumping on them, nipping at their heels, anywhere, but always between them and the danger. He forced them to belie their instincts and go on whither they were driven. Then the crowd broke into such a cheer as drowned the voices of fire and storm. The horses, at the sound, surged backward, and then they broke into a mad rush, helter-skelter. The mob leaped back to let them through. Twenty horses and one black and tan collie down the side street to Madison Avenue, through the whirling drifts, away from the hell of smoke and flame and ruin. Down the avenue they galloped, until Bruce herded them into another side street, out of sight and sound of the fire. Twenty horses saved, and one he rode the more. Against the wall of a brewery, he brought them together and held them, shivering in the icy tempest, until the stable hands captured them and led them to shelters in other stables. Down on his knees went James McMurray, he and the dog almost disappearing in the big snowdrift into which they rolled. The strong man caught the dog in his arms, and called him his dear, and his crudelin do. He, and he picked him up, and held him, kicking and struggling high above his own unhelmeted red head, while the crowd laughed, cheered, cried, yelled, and forgot all about the other fire lads who were still struggling with the waning fire. There was just one thing for them, and that was a collie with a singed black and tan coat, whose name was Robert Bruce McMurray. The following week, Engine House Number, was astonished to see a smart and polished delivery wagon, driven by a smart and beliveried flunky, draw up impressively at their door. From the inside of the vehicle, the flunky produced and delivered a package marked Robert Bruce McMurray. Callahan, with mouth agape, received it and looked at the address, wondering, Hey, McMurray, I think your dog is receiving a wedding present. It's a grand time for the company when Tiffany drives up to its door. McMurray took the box. It's very well gotten up, he said, turning it over and regarding its white and shining magnificence. "'Open it, man,' said Cummings, as he and the others came up to look. "'It's a wonderful thing. Where do you think it came from?' "'Open it! Open it! Here!' 
I'll whip those ribbons off with a whack of my knife. No, no, Callahan, I'll untie it. Tis a bonny box, and I wouldn't clip the strings. Gently now, tis of leather, and lined with satin. Woo! There, in the soft radiance of its cushioned bed, lay a magnificent dog collar, just Bruce's size, and a plate of solid gold tacked to it by the saints. Look, there's wording on it. Will you read it now? said Callahan, lifting it from its cushion and handing it to the captain, who had just come in. The captain read aloud, Robert Bruce McMurray, the fire dog, in grateful remembrance of services rendered on the night of January 27th, 1890. From the owner of the stables, to the dog who saved the lives of twenty horses. Bruce looked up wonderingly, as McMurray slipped the circle over his head. It's a proud day for the engine house, and for me, said the man. His voice trembled on the last word. It's a proud day for the whole company, by the same token, said Callahan. I was expecting to see a crown out of that box. Long be the day before Bruce gathers with the saints and wears a halo. End of Section 12 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana End of Dog Heroes of Many Lands by Sarah Noble Ives